image. Long after the great flood, when God made the rainbow shine forth as a sign of a covenant, 21 centuries from the time the promise was given to Abraham and Sarah, 13 centuries after Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt, and Miriam danced in freedom. 1,100 years from the time of Ruth and the judges, 1,000 years from the anointing of King David as king, in fulfillment of the times and years, the months and days discerned by the prophets, in the 194th Olympiad, the 752nd year from the foundation of the city of Rome, the 42nd year of the reign of Octavian Augustus, while the whole world enjoyed a span of peace, Jesus Christ, eternal God and Son of the Eternal Father, desiring to sanctify the world by his most merciful coming, being conceived by the Holy Spirit, and nine months of growth in the womb of his mother, now in our times is the nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ, God made flesh. Let us join together singing, O Come, Only Faith.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, you made this holy night shine with the brightness of the true light. Grant that here on earth we may walk in the light of Jesus' presence, and in the last day, wake to the brightness of his glory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. First reading this evening is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You've multiplied the nation, you've increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time onward and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 96. 96 responsibly. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing it to the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Proclaim God's salvation from day to day. Declare God's glory among the nations and God's wonders among all peoples. For great is the Lord and great is the praise. More is the fear of all gods. As for all the gods of the nations, they are but idols. But you, O Lord, have made the heavens. Ascribe to the Lord, you families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord honor and power. Ascribe to the Lord honor to you, holy name. Bring offerings and Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before the Lord, all the earth. Tell God among the nations, the Lord is King, the one who made the world so firm that it cannot be moved, will judge the people of heaven. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea thunder and all that is in it. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all You will judge the world with righteousness, and the peoples with your truth. The second reading is from the book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly. While we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, he it is who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please stand? Should be 
registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary, Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Have a seat. Kids, come on down.
And then whenever he blew up, he changed the world. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Asia. Yeah, it's more than that. That's the answer. Right? What? He did He did. Oh, another confirmation kid, guys. Hear this? Uh huh. Isn't he the person who put the nail on the That's what I did. That's Asia. Oh, yeah. So they added to the door. Martin Luther is why we have the Lutheran religion. You think? You think it might do something? All right. Martin Luther, let me give you his quote. Martin Luther says, the Bible, you know what the Bible is. What is it? But what is it? Go on. Good, good. Good job, you guys. It's a book full of oh, stories. And what are those stories for us? Yes. And? Okay. And? A road map, maybe um, like the Ten Commandments, a guiding thing for us, right? All right. Well, Martin Luther says, in these days, the Holy Bible is the manger that holds Christ. Uh -huh. that? I'm not doing that other thing. We have a... No, it's Benji. Oh, Benji. Oh, okay, hey. that's okay. Um, the Bible is the manger that holds Christ. Now, what does that mean to you? Yeah. I stumped you. Um, the Yes, John. Good job. Good job. I'm going to miss you. Believe me, I'm going to miss you. Yes, that's where we can find God. God isn't in the manger. We celebrate his birth every Christmas Eve, right? But he doesn't turn back into a baby. He's all grown up, you know. What we should be celebrating is that we're waiting for him to come again. All right? The Bible is the manger that holds Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you a candy cane, and you're going to tell me what you're hoping to find under the tree in the morning. And when you see the grown-up leave the sanctuary, you know they forgot it, and they've gone out together. <laughs> okay? Take a candy cane. What do you want? Uh, Christmas. <laughs> Think. Here, Ben. What do you want for Christmas? Okay. Roller plates. Ooh. What do you want for Christmas? A what? A hula hoop. I used to. <laughs> what do you want? A phone. You can tell the teenagers. Oh, God, this way, too. You don't have to wait until tomorrow for that one. Okay. All right. <laughs> and you? Okay. I knew you'd have more than one request. Sean, that's good. Here we go. Well, what do you hope's inside of coal? <laughs>
the gospel lesson. There was no place for them. With all the words that stand out to me as we return again to Christ's birth and the story of it this year, I'm struck by those words. There was no room for them, no place. So many of us spend so much time during this time of year carving out a space for those things that are sacred or are supposed to be sacred. We make a place in our busy lives for giving, for special meals, for time away from the routines of work or study, in the pursuit of a place to work or study. We take time to do extra baking, gift wrapping, extra time in picking out gifts, making sure we get what we think we want that person to have. Perhaps we even try to make a place for the Holy One who is being born in our midst again. And yet, and yet, when God arrives in our life and in our world, it's always at the center of the story that there was no place. Try as me, we might. I'm not sure we could ever make such a place. How could we possibly make a place for the author of the universe in our small, messy, complicated little lives and world? We tell famous stories, too, this time of the year of characters who had no desire to make a place like that. You know, Ebenezer Scrooge, Walter Haas, the Grinch, who lived just north of Whoville, Hans Gruber, isn't it? The Grinch remains one of my favorites. And of course, he learns the lesson that try as he might, he couldn't stop Christmas from coming. He couldn't steal hope, he couldn't steal joy, he couldn't shut them up from singing. But sometimes, I wonder if the Grinch's lesson is the one we need to learn. Maybe there are some Grinches and Scrooges among us, but I imagine more of us can identify with the little Who's. Maybe especially some of the Who's in the live action remake of that class classical cartoon. The Christmas Spirit Competition, remember that? That seems to define the season, the rushing around, the not knowing what we're doing, what we've got left to do, is it all done? We can relate. And I wonder if there's a lesson buried beneath the surface for us, beneath the Grinch's realization that he can't do anything to stop Christmas from coming. Maybe there's another epiphany. Not only is there nothing he can do to stop Christmas, there's nothing we can do to create Christmas. Because that first Christmas broke into this world like a thief, intruded our own way of being. The first Christmas arrived in the world and had no place for it. Christ was born in a world that had no place for him. Which, of course, is precisely why we need him so much. This is why, politics aside, I think it's really funny when we use phrases like, keep Christ in Christmas, keep him there. We started this whole thing to try to keep him out. And he doesn't need a five-point harness now, either. He's not about to fall out of anything. It's quite simply not up to us, thanks be to God. God chooses to bend down to earth, to live this messy, difficult life, to take on a body with all of its limitations and struggles and frailty, to enter the world through the body of a human mother, to enter with us in our blood and tears and every other bodily fluid that drenched that holy night. In the midst of all these Christmas lights and loveliness, it might be an uncomfortable to say all that out loud. It might scandalize us. And it should. It really should. So much more than it often does because we act like this little baby Jesus fits into our lives. In the manger scene, out front or on the mantle. But he doesn't. 
How could he? How could God fit on our lawns or on our mantles? The creator of the universe? The word that was with God hovering the formless void before the first breath of creation takes on an immortal life, is a helpless, weak, tiny child. It's impossible and unseemingly and beautiful and strange. God offers us the greatest mercy that we can never have imagined by putting himself at our mercy. And in that, we fail him, of course, to care for him as we should, then and now. We fail to welcome him, and he keeps returning to us in love. We can't possibly know how to make a place for God with us, for Emmanuel. I had a friendly argument with a colleague once about why we fill our worship space with beautiful things like gold and silver and fine linen. He thought that when we dress our altars with rich fabrics, we might come to convince ourselves that God appears there because it's so beautiful, because we've made a place worthy of the holy. And of course, we can't. We can't make this world worthy. Perhaps, though, we still dress our altars and our homes and ourselves as beautifully as we know how when we hear that the creator of the universe is coming close. If we resist what should probably be our first instinct, we need to run and hide when we know that the creator is coming. But if we seek to make our world as beautiful as we know how, it is only out of a desire to honor the divine presence as best we know how. God loves us so much that he shows up whether we found a way to prepare for him or not, whether our altars and our lives are beautiful or not, whether our hair is perfect or not, whether our families are harmonious or not, whether we're stressful or not, whether we're successful or not. If God would come to a feed truck in a stable, then God would come to a group of friends huddled around a car table, just as much as a shining gathering around a beautiful altar. God would even come here. God makes a place in the world that aches for God's presence but doesn't know how to make room for him. This, then, is the mystery of Christmas. Christ is born into the world whether we're bright, shiny, and happy or not. And if we're looking for where God would show up, we might not look so much to the bright, shining places, because that's not where God reaches into our existence. God enters on the full-on mess that is human suffering, oppression, injustice, poverty at Christmas. God makes a place, and it's not the kind of place we expect. God makes a place to be near to us because that's what God chooses. We don't have anything to do with this. More than glory and heavenly perfection and peace, God takes humble, imperfect humanity because God wants to be close to us more than anything. God wants us to find ways to grow, grow close to each other. God Give me the grace to remember that we cannot create Christmas. We can only receive it. We can't stop it. We can't make it happen because God breaks into a world that has no place for God and comes close to live among us in this Christ, born of Mary, a helpless baby, born among us again tonight. For this mystery and this act of grace upon grace, we give thanks. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand and say, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. <laughs>
church, the life of the earth, and the whole human family. Your infinite love is born to us this night. With choirs of angels, the church proclaims good news. Send us out as messengers of the hope that has come to all people. God of grace, hear our prayer. You are pleased to dwell with your creatures, and the whole earth sings for joy. Renew the splendor of creation from the smallest cell to the wise galaxies. Guide us to be wise stewards of your gifts for the sake of generations to come. God of grace, yeah. Your authority is over the nations. Break the rock of oppression in every land and free all people from fear. Bring peace where there is war, compassion where there is suffering, and healing where there is disease. God of grace, yeah. you cherish those who are the most vulnerable. Protect infants and children and bless those who care for them. Watch over women giving birth, tend the dying and relieve any who are in pain. Shelter refugee families and those who have no home. God of grace. Yeah. Your loving kindness embraces everyone in need. Help any for whom this season is lonely or joyless. Comfort those among us or known to us who are experiencing distress of body or mind, missing loved ones, or grieving. God of grace. Yeah. You welcome those who have died in the joyous light of glory. We give thanks for the saints of every time and every place who have praised you with lives of faith and humility. Inspire us by their example to love you by serving others. God of grace. Honoring the mystery of eternal love made flesh in Christ Jesus, we commend all for whom we pray to the mercy of God. Amen. You may be seated, and while we take up the offering, uh, musicians will play for us as I say.
I gotta come through the door over here. So we got those two doors and come in here. You guys uh, are gonna come up and go through the pews. You come up here and you can reach them the same way. Um, children, while we're doing this, nobody's found baby Jesus for me. There are two baby Jesuses hidden in this room. One goes under the tree, and one goes to the nativity scene over there. We've got to find Jesus, kids.